Hello, welcome back to the podcast version of Convergence 2012, written by Robert R. Ricks and read by the author. The story contains mature content and harsh language. There may be some content which may offend some listeners. If you're easily offended, please stop listening now. Make sure you check out the website at www.convergence2012.com and facebook.com slash convergence2012. Thank you for checking us out. I hope you enjoyed the story. This episode is brought to you by Zydeco Online, www.zydecoonline.com. Here we go. Chapter 2, The Tester. December 12, 2011. San Francisco, 2.08 a.m. The park was quiet, and when Kuthanaga shifted, there was no one around to witness his arrival. He stood there for a moment and collected his thoughts. Undoubtedly, the watchers had arrived, as he was the last to have shifted. Five thousand watchers were dispatched across the planet to mark the worthy and bear witness to his test. A single year to test and choose roughly one billion humans. It was a daunting task. He stood there and shook his head slowly. He knew it had to be done, and he was destined and prepared to play his role, a role he had spent the better part of a thousand years preparing for. He paused for a brief moment and could feel the others. He was satisfied that they had all made it. The fact that the others had survived the shift unscathed was a testament to their training and preparedness. Still, he wondered if it was right. He knew they couldn't save all the humans. Most of that was the humans' fault, but still, he wished there was something that could be less intrusive to gauge the ones who could be attuned. He closed his eyes and placed his hand over the large necklace which hung around his neck. It was similar to the necklace Denari and the other watchers possessed, just three times as large, and also one of the original ten that survived the arrival of the Anakai on Earth. He had been on a crust many times during his training and knew how to blend in well with the humans. In fact, he had already managed to secure several identities as well as amass a large fortune which would aid him on his mission. Kuthanaga stood five foot five inches tall and had deep sea-green mane of hair that was wild and flowing. It gently hung to the middle of his back. On his face there was a beard neatly trimmed into a V-shape that extended two inches below his chin. His features were strong and bold, yet there was a soft sadness around his eyes. He had eyes of a man who knew his own destiny and wasn't afraid of it. His skin was a soft tan with distinct difference of a shimmering pale red set of markings that covered his entire body. These fractal markings were identical on both sides of his body, forming an interconnecting tribal design that extended from the center of his chest outwards. His eyes were the deepest blue, and a storm that raged within shifted and flowed constantly. Kuthanaga's build was very muscular, with muscle bands not seen on humans. It was one of the distinct differences between the men and women of his kind. The women were almost identical to the human women, where the men were physically stronger with extra sets of muscles which allowed them to easily outperform a normal human male twice their size by a factor of four. He took a deep breath and with pure thought alone activated the gaklukun that hung around his neck. The center of stone flashed for a brief second and his form shifted and grew outwards. He stood six foot six inches tall with a deep brown skin complexion, heavy build to support half of his actual strength and no hair on his face or head. His eyes were piercing, and he chose a dark green for the final color. He chose the build of a linebacker, and yet moved stealthily like a cat. In this form, he was known to the humans as Desmond Washington. He was wearing a silk suit, black in color, with slight green trim. The tie was green and had a pattern of a great tree with roots running the bottom length of the tie, and branches reaching up through the top. He looked like he was worth a million dollars, and if truth be told, he was worth much, much more. He sighed and began walking. The sigh was not a sigh of boredom, but more of pity. He could hear a short distance away several people sleeping in makeshift shelters, and the frost on his breath told him it was cold out, cold enough to kill humans. To really affect him, it'd have to be much colder. He walked a few hundred feet and paused near a man who was passed out with a bottle tucked firmly under his arm, and bundled as much as he could be. He shivered slightly. Kuthanaga reached into the inside pocket and pulled out a wallet. Opening it revealed credit cards, IDs, and a billfold filled with large bills. He examined the man briefly, and after noting his aura, nodded to himself. The morning will be much better, friend. Sleep well. His hand motioned over the sleeping form, and warmth passed from him to the shivering man. He could feel the cold pang of addiction, the heartache of lost love, the pain of the system treating this man like a piece of filth. The shivering passed. He slipped the man $5,000 and took the bottle. You won't need this anymore. 
I wish your last year to be a happy one. So take this and start your path to happiness without any of these shackles. He walked on a few more paces and saw another man. After reviewing his aura, he slipped the man in a bottle and continued on his way. He could see the street, and there was light traffic flowing through the city like blood through the arteries of a concrete behemoth that refused to sleep. The stars were out, and the sky was clear, which was unusual for San Francisco this time of year. He knew all of this because he had sampled several individuals over the years prepared for his Desmond personality. The stars dully winked at him, and the moon's glow was a dim version of its natural radiant glory. He missed seeing things for what they really were, and he was anxious. His thoughts were interrupted as he heard footsteps quickly approaching. Three thugs had chosen the wrong guy to try to rob. Granted, two of the three were bruisers, and they were armed with knives. Normally, they would have easily taken out a human of Kuthanaga's size, but then they were dealing with an elite warrior of the Anakai, not a human. He waited until the last possible moment to slide to his left and spin. Using the momentum of the first man against him, he easily tossed him ten yards up and to the right. With a single punch, he broke the neck of the second assailant instantly. The final man had a pistol out and had Kuthanaga dead by right. With a thought, time suddenly shifted and slowed, which allowed Kuthanaga to dodge right and roll under the gunman's outreached arm, which he easily shattered as the gun fired. The gunman only saw a brief blur before the flash of white searing light flashed within his mind's eye and pain filled his world. He fell to the ground screaming and Kuthanaga knelt and whispered a single word. The gunman was silent and staring. What the fuck? Kuthanaga grinned perfect teeth at him. What do you mean? What? Why ain't I hurting no more? Because I want to talk with you. Kuthanaga examined a man and peered deeply into him. He saw pain, death drugs, brutality, and other negative experiences. He learned much about the human named Ken Christensen, a.k.a. Big T's, and he decided he would be perfect. What about, motherfucker? Tim, how would you like a job? Wh what? I said, how would you like a job? What the fuck are you talking about, man? You fucking with my head or what? No. Kuthanaga stared harder and lifted his hand and placed a single finger on Tim's head, the mark was there for the watchers to see. Tim was now a marked agent of Kuthanaga, and there were certain benefits to it, but also he'd be on a very short leash. You will do what I say, when I say, when I call you on this phone. Reaching into his pocket, he revealed a HTC droid cell phone. I'm fucking sorry, man, but you broke my goddamn arms. I can't do shit. Kuthanaga paused. Yes. Let's fix those. He closed his eyes for a brief moment and slapped upwards, lifting Tim to his feet. Tim was expecting more blinding pain and braced himself, and instead, warmth passed along his arms. What, what the fuck are you? Never mind that. How much were you required to do my bidding? Your what? My work. How much? Tim, you can put your arms down. Tim hadn't realized his arms were still stretched out. He let them fall to his side. His mind was reeling. None of this was possible. He felt dizzy. Five hundred dollars a day, he blurted out. I'll make it a thousand dollars a day, and will deposit it into this account. Opening his wallet, he handed Tim a debit card. The code to access is 6577. Serious? Kuthanaga paused and looked at him. Do I appear to be joking? Tim shook his head slowly. Dude, that's the code is... Last four numbers of your social. Yes, I know. That's why I chose it, so you wouldn't forget. Man, don't take this the wrong way or nothing, but are you the fucking devil? At that, Kuthanaga laughed. That, my friend, is truly funny. I'm sure when everything is said and done, many of you will feel that way. But some will think I'm far from that. So do we have a deal? Tim looked at his fallen friends and then slowly looked from his arms to Kuthanaga and swallowed slowly. His eyes darted to the pistol on the ground for just a brief moment. Kuthanaga retrieved the pistol and handed it to Tim with a grin. You were looking at this. Do we have a deal? Yes or no? Tim nodded. Good. First things first. Kuthanaga motioned over Tim's body and the addictions to meth, heroin, Cigarettes and alcohol were purged from his system, and Tim dropped to the ground as his body reeled from it. I could have made this painless, but I want you to remember it. That way, you won't go back to the poison. I'll know if you do, and worse, you'll know if you do. 
So your job for today is to stay clean and get your woman clean. If you can't get her clean, then lose her. I'll call on you soon. Be ready. Tim sat there for a few moments, breathing. His head was pounding, but for the first time in a long while it was clear. He could think. He took a single long, deep breath and was amazed that he didn't fall into a coughing fit. Sure thing, man. Any fucking thing you want. Clean up the language. You're working for me, and I don't care for it. Uh, okay. No problem, man. Kuthanaga turned at that and started on his way again. Tim looked at his pistol, which suddenly felt very heavy, and watched the tall man until he was out of sight. He slowly stood and glanced at his friends. Fuck, guys, I'm sorry. He started running then and didn't stop until he got home 36 minutes later.